part of the live show, the very start, where I take this cup and I take this teapot and I pour the tea directly into the cup. That's what's happening now. You can see it happening in real time. This is a lot like when uh, there's a comedy show, uh, I don't know if it's on UPN or whatever, way back in the day called Rock, which was not very good. Um, and on Rock, I think it was to like deal with fledgling viewing ratings, they decided to make it a live show. And at the start of the show, the main character, Rock, whoever the actor was, I can't remember his name, held out today's newspaper to prove to you that it was being broadcast live. Like it was like this really big deal that it was being broadcast live, but it didn't make the show any funnier or better in any way, shape or form. It was like the only real difference to me was that there was for like the, the word live was there. But <laughs> what that show has given us is the live pouring of the tea. So we've gotten that from it. That's what they provided us. I wonder if that was their intention. Hmm. Oh, that's good tea. We're starting a little early today. So we don't have many people here. Or people are tired of me. <laughs> we don't have many people here. Both of those are viable options. Um, what can I share about today <clears throat> that's new, that's going on? Well, first of all, my dog is right here. I'm, I'll show you. Here he is just chilling in my, that's a chair largely purchased for him. So he had a place to sit in my office. But he's been having some stomach trouble lately, and he has been farting up a storm. So he's just been blasting me in the face throughout most of the morning, the last couple of days. This is getting a little bit sexy. I'm going to just take a little bit of sex out of this video. There we go. Okay, I think we're ready now. Um, so Grimby's there. He's doing better. Uh, he's slowly on the mend, but he was evacuating from both directions over the course of the week. Rather unpleasant. Um, overall this week, um, there's a couple of things going on. One, the forge is starting proper next week and we've been doing a lot of getting ready, but I'm very much in the phase. It feels a bit like any time before I leave vacation or, you know, any kind of time there's a transition into something that's going to be a little more full on. There's a very real part of me that's like, well, you can't make me do anything like a teenager that's still very much alive. So this week I've felt, this weekend, maybe a little bit to the same extent last week, very resistant to doing anything, resistant to getting up on time, resistant to writing, resistant to editing, resistant to responding to emails or anything like that. And so that's just in my space a little bit. And I'm practicing bringing as much grace as I can to that because um, I don't typically have a lot of grace for myself and consequently for other people when that's where I'm at. Instead, I learned more to like, the stereotype for this would kind of be Jocko Willinks, like to just come on, fucking do it, do the thing, make do the work, make, do what you have to do, just get over yourself. Which, you know, we're kind of trained in that, but it's not the most, um, it's not a very powerful way to relate to ourselves or other people. And there's kind of like a lack, it's pretty heartless, you know, it's not a very kind, compassionate way to show up with ourselves. And if what's having me show up in that way is a degree of resistance. And if resistance is designed to protect us from being confronted by our fear, which I would assert it is, then um, it's sort of like, there's a part of me that's a bit scared. And then I'm yelling at that part of me, I'm sort of heartlessly berating it and hitting people with a stick when they're afraid, you'll get them to move but it's not really going to do much in terms of opening them up, getting them back present to possibility and having them be most fully expressed as themselves and then creating from that place. So the very easy place that it is for me to get to of being kind of heartless and ruthless with myself doesn't really do a lot. It, in the short term, it kind of moves me forward. When the long term and the medium term, it actually has me contract, close down even further. So. Oh, hello, Sheriff Hat. Uh, I see that you've kindly reminded me of your question. And don't you worry, I'm Sheriff Hat. It might be, you might want to check. I'm pretty sure that this is broadcasting live on YouTube. So you should be able to go and watch there if that's what you want to do. And I've got your question. It's the first here, but I love that you, I love you for um, presencing that for me. Uh, Sheriff Hat is a woman uh, who I'm in connection with who watches from Nigeria. Hey, Sheriff Hat. And, um, and she's really reliable to poke me and say, hey, answer that question that I asked you. And thanks for asking that question, Sheriff Fat. So we're gonna, we've got a few things that we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, we'll talk about how to avoid and even just deal with information burnout, this idea where we're really committed to achieving some kind of mastery or result, and then we just get all of this information and then it where we end up is kind of tired, exhausted, burnt out, not wanting to do anything resistant. How do we deal with that? How do we continue to grow in our journey? So we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about um, how to develop the muscle of choice and what what even is the muscle of choice. This is one that most people are just have undistinguished. So we're unaware that there's even a muscle of choosing and what that would look like and why we would need to exercise it and anything along those lines. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about a question I saw someone ask in another group that I was like, that'd be kind of a cool question to explore. And that is how to choose, how do I choose between my head or my heart and which is the right choice and what am I meant to do and all of that sort of stuff. And then lastly, um, we're going to look through Quora. I've got a bunch, about seven different things. Sometimes what I like to do for fun for a lark is go on Quora and scan just for um, questions people are asking about leadership and or answers and then speak to those so that we can start to see some misconceptions about leadership. And because um, really the best leadership is often counterintuitive and most leadership advice or teaching is more intuitive. It's like, well, this is obviously the thing to do. And so um, we're going to look through that and, and sort of break out some parts so that you can kind of see like, oh, wow, there's some stuff here that might be a little bit below the surface of what seems like the obvious answer. So let's talk about Sherifat's uh, question so that we don't forget that. She'll never forgive me. <laughs> so Sherifat writes, um, Something showed up for me, and I would love it if you can address it in your next video, Adam. The question is, what are we supposed to do with information? Does it get to the point where it's an excess? Here's an example. The last few years, I've been consuming a lot of information on anger or growth, together with watching your weekly show. So it got to a point where I was tiring, like I was always wanting to practice everything, make sure I understood everything, which led to burnout. And because of this, I naturally saw myself not wanting to learn anymore. So she really dove into as much material and information as she could find and then consequently found herself kind of on the other side of it. Fuck this. I don't want to do that. Um, I naturally saw myself wanting to learn more. How do I, you know, how do I work with that? What do I do with that? So let's, let's see here. I don't, I don't come with an answer. I don't want to start with an answer. I want to distinguish it in the moment with you. By the way, if you're one of the people here viewing, just write a comment. Let me know who's here. It'd be kind of cool to see you show up. Uh, what's your name? Oh, hey, Raf. Good to see you here, man. Um, so let's see. Um, first of all, this is super common. We tend to swing back and forth in um, in in our growth. So we start from not knowing anything, and then we're like, oh my god, now I can see the possibility. Hey, Kristen. Good morning. I really want to do this thing. Ah, let's do this thing. And then we dive into it. It's a very passionate approach. People with a lot of passion in their being tend towards this. And then we 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 absorb, absorb, absorb. We we just steep ourselves in whatever there is. And then we become, we get tired, burnt out. We burn out on it. So how does this all work? What do we do with that? First, we have some compassion for the fact that that's just the natural part of our process. And I think what underlies this is to some extent, part of the reason why coaching is so valuable and why it's so hard for us to create the changes that we want to create on our own. So there's like this really well-known Zen, um, I think it's a Zen story, a parable perhaps, where this person comes to the master, you know, a master swordsmith and says, master, I, I wish to learn to become a master swordsmith like yourself, how long will that take me? And the master looks at him and takes a breath and thinks, and is like, it'll take you 10 years. He says, well, what I'm really dedicated. So what if I, what if I throw myself into this and I learn everything and I really, I really commit myself and I sacrifice everything to do it. And the master, of course, you already know how that's going to go. He pauses, he says, well, then that will take you 20 years. And the student says, what are you talking about? Why would it take me that long? I'll be so committed. He says, yes, but 
from the urgency and the attachment to achieving any kind of particular result, you're not going to have much room for the process of growth. You're not going to have much spaciousness for your own discovery and to make the kind of mistakes that are necessary to become a master. You're going to be so fixated on doing this the right way and getting it all done. And that's going to get in your way. Good morning, Tommy. Nice to have you with us. So as a result, it's going to take you longer. So that parable is kind of cold comfort. It gives us a bit of insight though, like, okay, that's, that's, this is not a new thing. What there really is to do with all of this, well, I'm going to describe how we would approach this inside the container of coaching or the container of leadership, how we would work with what's showing up inside that container where we have the opportunity for things to go different than they always do. So Sherifat, and if anyone has this resonating for them, probably for you as well, it's really common for us to, um, to, to show up this way, to want to make the thing happen and then to really commit ourselves. You know, when people make New Year's resolutions, one of the things that you can guarantee is that there, there's like a lot of significance about the resolution and there's a, like a degree of sort of throwing themselves off a cliff into the thing. Like, it's not like they partially do it or, or go halfway. They do it all, all or nothing is kind of the approach that they take. Good morning, Evan. And uh, whatever your photo was that you just recently posted, you look fantastic in it. I don't know if that was from Trevor or, or something else. Just a really nice like photo of you with your mustache and then like kind of blurry background, look really sharp. So it's kind of human. We throw ourselves into something and we do that for a few reasons. We, we, we don't want it to go the way it always does in the past. We don't want this not to go the way that it tends to go. We want it to go differently. This time we want this to stick. We want this to be the thing that really works. So we throw ourselves at it with gusto. Two, we have a story that where we are right now is not okay and we should be over there. And so from that story, we like, we really, we, we throw, we exaggerate the actions we take. We really thrust, pardon me, we really thrust ourselves into whatever we're doing in a very all or nothing kind of approach, almost like in an effort to, to get to where we want to be so that we don't have to be where we don't want to be. Here I am currently as a novice, I don't want to be here. So I'm going to totally consume all this information and do all this stuff so I could finally get here. And then once I'm here, things will be great. The trouble with that approach is if you can't enjoy where you are currently, if where you are currently is wrong or bad or not good enough or where you shouldn't be or something along those lines, you're not going to be able to experience much joy in your, in your process. And if you can't experience much joy, much spaciousness, if you can't slow down and appreciate where you are, if you can't have any of that stuff, then the journey from where you currently are to where you want to get to is not going to be very pleasant. There's not going to be much room for discovering or for sort of like those moments where you get caught, you get feedback or something. You're like, well, shit, here I am doing that thing again. And, and as a result, burnout's almost inevitable because there's, there's very little joy then in the process you're in, all that the sort of joy that could exist is that once I arrive here, then I'll be happy. And so your whole step, every step you're taking along the way to get there is miserable. There's no joy in it at all. And if there's no joy in you doing something at all, it's inevitable you're gonna burn out on it, right? How long can you do something that's misery for you? How long can you sit in a conversation with yourself that is ultimately, I'm not enough. I'm not there yet. I'm not good enough depending on your capacity for self-flagellation, for like masochism, you'll be able to white knuckle through that for X amount or less amount of time, but there's a limit to it. You can only do that for so long. And so from this sort of underlying context, from this way that, that things are set up, the game on the top of consuming as much information as possible has a half-life. It's got a limitation and burnout is just naturally a part of that process. So I'll talk about what we would do with that in a coaching container, but like just in general, one of the most valuable things we can do is like 
honor and hold sacred and precious our our passion our commitment to really lean in and to take this stuff on and to really like wow i am someone who really cares about this and really wants to do it but then we want to practice marrying that with a complete like love and compassion and grace for where we are right now and to really like see where we are as like every bit as precious and sacred and beautiful as where we want to get to and even this starts to get a bit esoteric but like holding them is no different from one another it's like the the, man, the mantra in, in zen prior to enlightenment you chopped wood and carried water and after enlightenment you chopped wood and carried water there's no like then after enlightenment ride magical unicorns across a rainbow you continue to chop wood and carry water it's all the same there is no real difference so Sherifat, for you, that's where I would invite you to put a lot of your time is make sure that you're putting focus on like, hey, what is there for me to enjoy in this right now? Where can I find the delight, the pleasure, the joy, the discovery in all of this, as opposed to trying to get yourself somewhere? Anytime we're trying to get ourselves somewhere and the journey becomes solely a means to arriving at that place, it's a recipe for burnout. This is often what's happening when people start to feel burnt out is they're just like, I don't want to keep doing something that's no fun. And that's not a problem with you. That's an indication that you're alive and well. If you don't wish to keep doing something that's not very enjoyable for you, that's a good thing. That means that you're sober and, and alive and aware of life. Some people will numb themselves in order to white knuckle through the misery. So what tends to happen inside this structure, this construct we've just laid out, is that there's a half-life to how long people can continue doing something they ultimately feel miserable in, in order to arrive at a particular end. And then when you get really high achievers, people drawn to careers like law, medicine, et cetera, et cetera, executive leadership, and so on and so forth, they will, because this half-life, this limitation, this burnout that's inevitable is kind of a problem in the way of the end that they're committed to arriving at. And because they can't see what we've just laid out here, it's they're, they're blind to it. They'll turn to substances and other ways of numbing themselves from the misery that they feel day to day. So alcohol, affairs, illicit affairs, drugs, porn, overworking, adrenaline sports, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of what that does is it allows us to kind of numb out of this misery and then we can stay in it. We're still miserable, but we're we're kind of turning off our ability to feel that misery. I'm miserable. Life sucks. It's not really that much fun, but at least I don't have to feel it too bad. I'm not too present to that pain. And if you're not too present to the pain, you can keep doing it. So this is a little bit like if you sprained your ankle and then you were walking to get somewhere. There's no joy in that walking. It's miserable. And eventually with enough time you're going to be like fuck this this hurts i'm not going to keep doing it but if you take painkillers so you don't feel the pain of your sprained ankle as you walk on it then you can keep walking it causes you a lot of pain and in the long term it's doing it's doing damage to you but it can allow you to keep walking that path for longer i'm not advocating for this i'm i'm simply distinguishing that this is energetically and spiritually what a lot of people are engaged in is numbing themselves from the pain that they feel because they have a belief that the pain they feel is like a sign that they're lazy or that there's something wrong with them instead of really holding it with some reverence and being like oh actually what there is for me to do is honor what's showing up and knock knock it off hey amy nice to have you with us um evan i don't know what tacos relates to but i agree yes to tacos what are your favorite tacos everyone please put in the comments your favorite taco right now i would say for me it's probably uh al pastor i really like an al pastor taco hello so um now let's talk about just what might be different inside of a coaching conversation so the way things can go in a coaching conversation is first of all what people a knit fish tacos excellent evan yep Good call. What people initially think is going to happen in coaching is they're going to show up, do the thing that they've been doing for as long as they can do. And then me or someone else or whoever as their coach is going to like see them starting to slow down 
and burn out and I'm going to come up and I'm going to haymaker in them, them in the top of the head. And they're going to be like, ah, okay. I'm going to get back to doing the misery that is my life. And, and then I'll achieve the result and everything will be amazing. Hey, Jess. <clears throat> oh my God. Carne asada street tacos a few times a week. Unbelievable. I'm going to come visit you whenever I am, wherever you are and, and have, uh, carna, carna, carnitas, carna asada street taco. Oh man, I'm, I really think I'm going to have some Mexican food for lunch today after this. You guys are getting me hungry. Tacos. So good. I'm just going to say something that's not super popular right now because corn tortillas are very popular, but I think flour tortillas are the best. So that's, that's my opinion. NorCal, you guys probably have some really good uh, Mexican food. <laughs> Amy, Amy's making notes for taco to do's. My, I really want to wordsmith that because those words look like they're designed to come together like tacodos, but it doesn't, it doesn't quite work. Okay. So people think they're going to hire a coach and the coach is going to whack them in the back of the head when their um, attempts to white knuckle through the misery to the pot of gold they believe they're going to get at the end of this. The coach is going to do that. And many coaches will in error, I would say. Not because those coaches are dumb or something, but just because that's our human tendency, right? I'm trying to force myself to do the to do the thing that I can't seem to white knuckle through. So of course, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do the exact same thing to the other person I'm coaching until I've worked through this myself. But a coach is really deep in their work and has, has kind of taken this on. What tends to happen is that the client shows up and at first they try to perform and, and white knuckle their way through this and make it all happen. Their misery kicks in. They don't feel good about this. They don't enjoy it. None of it feels kind of fun or interesting or anything like that. And they say, fuck this. And so then what they do is they decide the coaching is not working. And a coach that's really um, deft and skilled with that person is going to meet them there and say like, well, let's look at what's not working. What isn't working? And the client's going to be like, well, this sucks. You know, I'm trying to do this thing. And once again, it's not working. And the opportunity inside the container of the coaching is to take a look at like, well, what is it you're trying to do that isn't working? Well, I'm trying to like make myself do this thing and it's miserable and I'm not enjoying it. And like, I notice I'm starting to not want to show up to coaching because I think you're going to make me do the thing and I just don't want to do it great. So there's a part of you <clears throat> that's trying to force you to do something. And there's another part of you that doesn't actually want to do that thing. What do you typically do when that tension is live? Well, I, I try to re-engage with the forcing part until eventually I say, fuck it. Great. Okay. Well, what is, what do you think is here? They would have you not wanting to do this. Like what, what, what do you imagine that's about? So we, rather than try to force people to just do the thing over top of whatever's showing up, we dive into what's showing up. Oh, this is some resistance showing up. What do you think that might be about? What do you think it is that you're resisting? Well, it's not fun at all. It sucks. Okay, well, well, that makes sense. And then we can start to have a conversation with that. So one of the common misconceptions of coaching is that it's like this thing that comes over the top of your resistance and forces you to take action which is a lot like people kind of relate the, the common misconception about coaching is that it's a lot like a parent, a parent to a teenager forcing the teenager to clean up their dishes. In fact, coaching dives into whatever's showing up. It, it has you, it makes you more whole by honoring every little piece of you that shows up. And what that does is it takes away a lot of the burnout because you stop being in resistance to whatever's going on for you internally. Part of the nature of information burnout is that we're resisting something that's already there. We're resisting a part of ourselves that's like, I don't want to read more information right now. This sucks. Great. Stop doing it. Let's get curious about that. Let's get curious about why you're trying to force yourself to do something. And let's get curious about the part of yourself that doesn't want to do anything. And underneath all of this, what gets built is a much deeper level of trust in yourself. That trust gets developed because you start to honor whatever's showing up for you. You start to trust that when you have resistance to something, it doesn't mean that you, every time you have resistance, you just stop doing everything you're doing. What it means is that you start to pay attention to it. You start to honor it. You listen to it and you get curious about it. And that has you stop being in this constant state of distrusting yourself. A lot of us 
largely like almost globally, what I notice with most humans is that we have, we have a deep distrust of ourself. And that distrust sounds sort of like, well, if I really just stop doing the stuff that I'm trying to make myself do, I'll just lay on the couch and never do anything. If I really stop forcing my hand to do this and I'll just become an alcoholic, I'll just lose my job. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just. And then what happens is we get in a tug of war and wherever you find yourself in life is sort of the equilibrium for that tug of war. So like, I don't want to do this, but I kind of have to. And then that you're, you're going to not be able to get much further than whatever results currently exist in your life where that keeps you held. And when we are in the practice of honoring what's showing up, we start to let go of like, I don't want to do this. Great. Let's drop this part and like, look at that. And maybe what happens is for like a month, you don't do anything. And over time, first that drives up some fears about what's going to happen. But then what tends to happen is over time, a natural desire to do whatever, to do something new shows up because doing anything perpetually is boring. If all you did every day, like Bay has this, this phase she goes through usually once a month, maybe once every two months where she's like, I don't want to, I don't want any clients and I don't want to do anything. And I just want to write children's books. Great. Or when it's really extreme, it's like, I just want to sit on the couch with Grimby and watch TV. And in the moment it feels really real to her. And like, that's all she would ever want to do. But I know because I know my wife, I know that after about a week of that, maybe two weeks, she'd find something else to do because it's just not who she is. And it's not who you are either. As humans, who we are is not just sitting on the couch watching TV. So we develop this trust. And I guess that's a bit of a digression, but that's what there is to do with information burnout. And that's how coaching works with it, is we meet you in the burnout that's showing up rather than trying to shove you through it. Ironically, what a lot of coaching does is it tends to leave you in even deeper distrust of yourself because the coach, not responsible for doing their own work, puts onto you the very same strategy they put onto themselves, which tends to align with the strategy you're trying to put on yourselves. And then what happens is you're like, I don't want to do the thing, but I should. So let's force myself to do the thing. And then the coach empowers that. And then where that leaves you is even further from your ability to trust that resistance that's showing up. It's kind of, it's kind of tragic. It's not that it doesn't provide some kind of help or support or anything like that, but like a lot of coaches aren't aware, they just can't see it, right? They can't see it in themselves. So they can't see them putting this over there on other people. And it kind of, um, it just leaves people untrusting of themselves, not able to honor what's showing up. And that makes for a tiring life. Okay, um, let's talk about this question that showed up in another group I'm part of. I'm not going to name the person's name, but they someone said, hey, what, what questions do you have? We're, do, we're going live. We're going to ask this person some questions. What questions do you have? And one of the questions they asked was, um, is it better to listen to your mind or your heart or what your body feels about something while taking serious decisions or to find balance between them? Like, what about a job? Is it better to choose the better paid job you like or the one you can love and make it paid well? And what do you do if you have a big project, which could be great, but you still need more management skills and you need to manage time between two jobs, healthy cooking, yoga, and you would love to dance, but day is only 24 hours and a lot more. So the heart of this question is like, hey, uh, what do I do? I've got my head telling me one thing. I've got my heart telling me another thing. How do I, what's the right way to choose? So we, we have to start the conversation by acknowledging, kind of caveating that there is no right way to choose for any of this. And as soon as we're looking for the right way to choose, so it's like, as soon as we're kind of like, ah, the correct answer is my heart. Yeah, until, because <laughs> then whew, Grimby just, bl you just blasted me there, buddy. I just got blasted in the face with a fart. Mm, that smells like cabbage that's been left out for seven weeks and then had eggs cracked on it. Okay, I'm just coming back into consciousness. He actually managed to concuss me there. All this talk about tacos now makes me feel sick. <laughs> it's Grimby's fault. Uh, so anytime we have a rule, we put ourselves into trouble. 
there there can't be a rule because any rule sets an arbitrary um direction no matter what the circumstances and what that does is it takes us out of the moment you can't be in the moment if you have a rule to follow instead you are in the rule the rule is what dictates your actions as opposed to the moment so Eckhart Tolle talks about this in The Power of Now. You know, the, the heart of that book is about, hey, America, nice to see you. The heart of The Power of Now is about being in the now as opposed to following whatever set of rules there are to follow. Now, this doesn't mean that we should then just throw out all the rules because then we would live in anarchy. And I think most of us would agree that while society has many, many, many problems and it's far from perfect, it's better than utter anarchy like barbarism, you know, like what's happening with the Taliban in Afghanistan and that sort of stuff, like we're better off with a degree of government, governance, laws dictating that you can't murder people, you shouldn't loot, we want to honor property, all of that sort of stuff. So, <clears throat> so having said that, having made that caveat, we really want to be cautious about a rule, like the rule being like, oh, just always follow your heart. Oh, just always follow your mind. But Here's what I notice, having said all that. Generally speaking, as humans, we're trained out of following our heart. And the your heart is kind of, we're speaking metaphorically, of course, because your heart's ultimately just an organ that moves blood through your system. But like the heart center, the, the spiritual notion of a heart, your desires, your feelings, your, you know, that part of you, that that is your captain of your ship or even like the admiral that tells you the direction you want to go and often you know in your heart what you want long before your head even comes into play our head is a lot like the navigator what our head does is it helps us be like well, okay watch out there's shoals of rocks there there's a dangerous island over there that has a sea monster and over there is a whirlpool charybdis from greek mythology oh, i love saying that word Skyla, I think, was a sea monster, and Charybdis was the whirlpool. So what your head does is it helps you navigate stuff. And your head's job is to save you from fear. It's to keep you, it's kind of to honor your fear so as to keep you safe and alive. That's what the job of your head is, or at least so I assert. So what tends to happen is that rather than letting the heart lead and the head navigate, we, we do this, we, we get them out of order. And so then what happens is we kind of get into these problems like, well, what, what do I want? What do I want? And then the first question is like, then the first point of, of call for that question becomes our head. And what it does is like, well, that's dangerous. That island's scary. There's a sea monster over there. So I'm not gonna, we're not gonna even consider wanting anything in those areas. So already, you know, this is the problem with putting the navigator in front of the captain is we're never gonna end up journeying on some journey to get somewhere fantastic, somewhere new, somewhere different, because the head's job is to eliminate that stuff. The head's job is to protect us from all the dangers. If you want to live a life led by your heart, which is to say, if you want to live a life where you lean into your desires, if you want to live a life where you lean into possibility, if you want to live a life where you, if you want the life of your dreams, that requires letting your heart guide you and letting, letting your heart guide you requires a willingness on your part. I mean, some weird noises out my window a willingness on your part to have your heart broken. There's no possibility for guy, like leaning into your heart and living that life if you're unwilling to have your heart broken. And so this is where most people end up is at some point, somewhere along the way of our lives, we had our heart broken, probably a bunch growing up. And then we learn to close it and to protect it and to tighten it up. And consequently, we're unwilling to have our heart broken. We're unwilling to be dashed against the rocks. There's a book I want to read from as I am um, sharing this, a little parable I'll share with you. And so until you're willing to have your heart broken, you're kind of screwed. And something that's important to recognize here is that most of your friends, your family, your peers, they're engaged in protecting you from having your heart broken. That's what they're about. 
So if you tell them, I was listening to a friend, a couple of friends of ours where we were in a conversation and one of them was uh, someone in his uh, group wants to become a baker. And he was telling the person he was sharing with us, he was telling them, well, that's not a good morning, Heather. That's not a good career. Who are we to say what is and isn't a good career? There are bakers making much, much, much money. And there are some bakers making not very much money, but that are just in love with the life that they have. And while not everyone will become wildly successful, I assert it's possible. You can become successful doing anything. If you're willing to pour your heart and soul into something and get supported along the way, it's all possible. It's either all possible or none of it's possible. And I say it's all possible. So that's an example of someone trying to protect someone from heartbreak. The trouble is, until we're willing to allow ourselves to be heartbroken, we can't really learn about what, what caused that heartbreak. How did I make that happen? And until we get to that place, we can't really learn to do anything different to navigate those waters differently. So all of this kind of keeps us in check. Hey, Abril. Abril, I'm really stoked to hear that they no longer do. And the thing... I want to I want to honor your experience, and then I also want to honor your family, so that we can hold all of it with love and um, reverence. Your family were really doing their best, I would assert. Maybe maybe it wasn't very artful, but they were doing their best to protect you from heartbreak. That's what we do: is we individually learn the pain of heartbreak, and then we learn to protect ourselves from that, and then we try to give the rest of the world the same thing we've learned over here. So if I've learned to protect myself from heartbreak, then of course, I'm going to try to offer that to you. I'm going to try to protect you from heartbreak by convincing you not to do the thing that I'm certain is going to leave you heartbroken. And if it's really a pursuit in honor of your heart, if it's really you going for your deepest desires in your love, inevitably, you're going to get heartbroken. That's the cost to entry. That's the gate we have to walk through. So like totally get like your family, the impact of what they were trying to do left you demotivated, right? It, it talks you out of following your heart. How many of us have had that experience where we're like, well, I'm going to university and I'm going to be an accountant. Nothing wrong with being an accountant, but like getting that degree because we believe it's a good way to make money because we feel that's what's important. When what we really want is to be a musician or to pursue, you know, baking or to pursue anything like that our heart claims or to go into accounting when our parents are musicians are like, you should be a hippie or, you know, whatever it happens to be. So our family do tend to end up demoralizing us, not because they're villains, but because they are trying to protect us from heartbreak the same way they're trying to protect themselves from heartbreak. And it's kind of tragic. And it's awesome, Abril, that you kind of, you know, are, are acknowledging that and, and, um, and that they no longer do. That's a beautiful thing. The same thing happened for me. Law, gold-plated career. When I was studying to be a lawyer, when I was pr practicing law, my family really got this. They really understood it and um, they were behind it. And then when I shifted into coaching, them and my peers were like, what the hell is Adam doing? What is this nonsense? I already know leadership because everyone thinks they know leadership. What does he even believe he has that allows him to coach people? This is a weird profession, blah, 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 blah. I am far more prosperous. And, and when I say prosperous, I mean like in every facet of life. Like my heart is far more open. My spirit is far more expressed. My bank account is far healthier, et cetera, et cetera, than I ever would have been as a lawyer. I can tell you that with absolute certainty because it's the expression of who I am. Avril, I love, I love what you saw for yourself there. You know, you've never seen a situation like this. So thank you. Thank you for really being open to that and for, you know, like giving your family a little bit more grace. Because when you do that, you provide the space for them to give themselves more grace. So really beautiful work just in that moment. So if we go back to this question that this person is asking, is it better to listen to my mind or my heart or what my body feels? Well, it's a good idea to listen to all of it, but we wanna recognize the roles that each, each of those parts of ourselves has. So if I listen to my head, my head is gonna, point to the dangers. It's going to point to the, the shoals and the reefs that will break my heart. Actually, before I go down this path, I'm going to read this parable. It's a really beautiful parable. Any of you that have followed me for any period of time have probably heard me read it. It's from this book, Illusions by Richard Bach, which I will type right in here. Boom. There we go. 
Um, so just a beautiful, beautiful book. I highly recommend it. It's probably my favorite book of all time. And at the start, there's a parable, <clears throat> which I will read to you. So once there lived a village of creatures along the bottom of a great crystal river. The current of the river swept silently over them all, young and old, rich and poor, good and evil. The current going its own way, knowing only its own crystal self. Each creature in its own manner clung tightly to the twigs and rocks of the river bottom, for clinging was their way of life, and resisting the current, what each had learned from birth. But one creature said at last, I am tired of clinging. Though I cannot see it with my eyes, I trust that the current knows where it is going. I shall let go and let it take me where it will. Clinging, I shall die of boredom. The other creatures laughed and said, fool, let go and that current you worship will throw you tumbled and smashed across the rocks and you will die much quicker than boredom. But the one heeded them not and taking a breath did indeed let go and at once was tumbled and smashed by the current across the rocks. Yet in time, as the creature refused to cling again, the current lifted him free from the bottom and he was bruised and hurt no more. And the creatures downstream, to whom he was a stranger, cried, Look, a miracle, a creature like ourselves, and yet he flies. See the Messiah, come to save us all. And the one carried in the current said, I am no more Messiah than you. The river delights to lift us free, if only we dare let go. Our true work is this voyage, this adventure. But they cried all the more, Savior, all the while continuing to cling to the rocks. And when they looked again, he was gone. And they were left alone making legends of a savior. So our brain is the part of ourselves that clings to the rocks. And it's not always a bad, we can't listen to that story. You can, sorry, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's a, a bit of a trap to listen to that story through the lens of, oh, clinging to the rocks is for morons. I'm just going to throw myself around and let, you know, whatever. No, clinging to rocks is important. Like I said earlier, we need society. It's important. It allows us to create far greater things than we could do as individuals in an anarchy. Um, we need to have the ability to schedule something. I want to be able to tell my wife that we are going to meet for lunch and then we are going to agree and actually show up and meet each other for lunch as opposed to like, I don't know, I just I decided I was going to pick my nose. So I ended up doing that for three hours instead of meeting you for lunch, You know, whatever. So our head, though, its job is to, to have us cling to the rocks when danger is perceived, to do the stuff that makes rational sense so that we're not tumbled and smashed across the rocks. The trouble is that what you want from your heart will require a willingness to be tumbled and smashed against the rocks. And so is it better to listen to your mind or your heart? There's no real answer there, but I would often suggest to people that they start by listening to their heart first. If we can get present to what's possible, if we sit down with the two jobs and we feel into our heart, like if I knew I was going to be fine, no matter how this worked out, right? That's the question. That's the sort of statement that lets you take your head offline a bit. If I knew that I was going to be fine, no matter how this went, if I knew I was going to land on my feet, if I knew that I wasn't going to make a decision that I would regret for the rest of my life, if I could let all of that go and I could just sit with this idea, this notion that whatever I chose is okay, what would I choose? And that is your heart's choice. Oh, I, I would choose this job, no brainer. Got it. So then everything that follows is your head trying to manage your fear. Your fear is about like, but what if? What if this goes that way? What if it goes this way? The truth of all of this is that we don't know the future. And and what our head tries to do is like foresee the worst case scenario and head that off of the pass. But all that does is it ends up shrinking the world and your possibility inside of it down bit by bit by bit. Oh, well, I might, I might lose my job. So now what I'm going to do is make my decisions in such a way that I never lose my job. But how maybe losing your job is really the thing that's going to set you free. You know, like maybe getting fired would be the best thing in your life because it would have you really take a look and really like dig down and discover this fortitude in yourself you didn't realize was there. Maybe getting dumped by your partner is what allowed you to really realize how important your relationship was to you and then recommit and then get them back. 
or to have your heart broken because you didn't get them back. And then to find the person that really did show up in such a way that had you want to devote yourself fully instead of trying to convince yourself to devote yourself fully. So the, the point here is that all of this stuff is in the nebulous future and we don't have any way of knowing. And what our head focuses on is just the negatives of the future. It doesn't put much attention on the positives because that's like, well, I don't have to worry about that. It's not gonna kill me. I have to worry about the negative stuff. So when we're making decisions from our head, it often ends up being focused on an avoidance of a negative future we are afraid of. So I don't have a real good answer, I guess, for her question. I'm realizing as we're as we're going through this is like, it's not better to listen to one or the other, but because our our bent, so many of us are bent towards listening to our head and letting that make our decisions. It can be a really valuable practice to start putting the heart first, and often. When people are in a consideration about a program, like people want to work with me as a coach, or they want to consider the forge or even the creating clients course, and they want a conversation and we get on the phone and where they're at is they're kind of like, oh, I, I think I want to do this, but I'm afraid and I'm worried that blah, blah, blah. And then, and then what they have is like a whole, they've got like a bunch of questions they've laid out. Sort of like, well, what about this? What about this? Can we do this? How does this work? What if this happens? A bunch of that stuff. And I'm always a yes to, to being in that conversation, to answering all those questions. But the first question I usually ask them is, it's one of two. And they're the same question, really. The simplest form is like, if we set all that aside, what does your heart want in this moment? Does it want to do this program or does it not? One of the ways our brain kind of keeps us safe is it introduces a bunch of like confusion about whether you want to do something, but your heart still knows. The way that works for the brain is as long as you're confused, you're not going to take action. In the face of confusion, you will stay in the status quo. So it's a very effective way for your brain to keep you safe. Get this guy confused and then he'll just stay here and then we don't do the risky thing. So what we're doing is we're kind of setting that aside. We're cutting through the Gordian knot and saying, okay, we can answer all those questions, but what does your heart want? Does it want to do this work or does it not want to do this work? And the beautiful thing about that is if we get to, if they're like, I don't think I want to, great, no need for any more. We, we don't have to engage with any of that confusing stuff. We don't have to have an hour long conversation. You already are clear. And if the heart's yes, well, great. But at least now we're clear that you want something. We can answer all those questions, but we have a new lens for it. Instead of trying to figure out the answer to whether you want this or don't, we know the answer. And now what there's to do is to address the, the fear that's in the way of you having what you want. That's a different conversation. The other way I'll ask that question is, you've got all of these questions. I wanna check in with you, knowing that we'll address them. Are you kind of asking these questions because you're a yes and you're, you're afraid of that and you're hoping to like find a way to get to a yes? Or are you asking these questions because you're a no and you're afraid of that and you're, you're trying to hoping that we can get to a point where you're convinced of your no? So it's the same kind of question. We're just asking like, what are you really in your heart of hearts? Where do you find yourself? It doesn't mean you have to go in any of these directions. You can be a yes and still choose no, but at least now you're clear, oh, this is a situation where I really want to be a yes and I'm going to choose no. And what that does is it gives you more information and it helps you start to distinguish this more, which again, brings you closer to trusting yourself. You start to see more often, oh, wow, that was a situation where I really wanted to be a yes and I chose this way. And then you get to like, how is this working out for me that I made that choice? Am I regretting it? Am I wishing I could go back? Do I feel, you know, blah, 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 blah. Those are the options that show up. Uh, Jess, I loved what you said. You, Jess, you wrote, I love what you said about, we still, we will still be carrying water and chopping wood. Where do I find this to read it? Um, the best thing to do would just be to Google Zen, chop wood, carry water, uh, carry water, chop wood, something along those lines. It's very short. That's literally what it is though. It's before enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water. After enlightenment, we chop wood and carry water. You may be able to find some teachers that have, um, elaborated on that more. The if, if anyone is looking for a good Zen book, the one I would suggest is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Who is the author of that? It's, uh, uh, I can't remember his name. They have Tibetan names that I find very challenging, but um, 
that book, you can find a copy on Audible that's read by Peter Coyote, who's read a lot of books and has a very soothing voice. It's a really great audio book. I listen to it a lot when I'm falling asleep. The book to read is also very good. And it's a compilation of lectures. This teacher, I really want to know his name. I think it's Shin Suzuki, maybe. Do I have it on my, I don't think I have it over here. Anyhow, look up Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It's a really great book if you want to sort of get a bit more of like an Eastern idea on coaching because at its heart, coaching is often applied Zen is one of my beliefs. So that's a good book, really good one to read. Okay, let's talk about the muscle of choice. What are you guys getting from this? Let's. I just want to see someone write something in the comments. Let me know what's coming through. What are you picking up from what I'm putting down? I'm putting something down. What are you picking up from it? I'll refill my tea. Also, let me know if um, I wrote Zen Mind Beginner's Mind in the comments, but I'm using Restream. Let me know if that came over to Facebook. I don't I don't think it actually did because I don't see it here. So I'm going to write, write it right here. I think it just spits that out to um, YouTube, which is not that helpful. Restream, work yourself out. Uh, okay, I'm going to set up this conversation for the muscle of choice while I just wait to see what you guys are picking up. The muscle of choice. Oh, Heather, you missed so much. You missed it all. It's all missed. You, you, there's nothing for you to get. Hey, Deborah, nice to see you. Coaching is applied Zen. That's that's not truth, right? That's just how I. That's one of the ways I hold it. But if you read about Zen, if you study it you'll often find a lot of the heart and soul of coaching is aligned with those principles. And in fact, in um, Who Do You Think You Are, the book I'm editing before publishing, there's a, a bunch of acknowledgements where I trace the lineage of my work. And you know, initially it was um, the, the old masters, Plato, Aristotle, talking about ontology and what is the being of a, of a, of a rock or of a thing, and then to Zen, and then from Zen to Alan Watts and Werner Earhart into Landmark, and then from there into Accomplishment Coaching, and then down uh, through that to me. Um, that's that's the lineage I hold. I don't know how to what extent we could you know prove or disprove that, but that's how it occurs for me. Um, and my friend Toku, uh, who some of you may know, practiced in a Zen monastery for I can't remember how long it was. Might have been three years almost. I don't know if it was quite that long, but when he and I talk about these sort of heady subjects and kind of nerd out on coaching and Zen, we often arrive at that same kind of conclusion. Like, yeah, there's a lot of the art of Zen in the practice of coaching. We're bringing people closer to their own truth. That's ultimately what's happening in Zen. So uh, the muscle of choice. Let's see how I'm going to enter this conversation. Most of us don't really understand the notion of choice as a starting point, like the, the distinction of choosing something. So to choose something is like, here are two bowls of ice cream. One is vanilla and one is chocolate. Which will you choose? Now, what a lot of us will tend to do in that situation is be like, well, which do I like more? What do I prefer? Do I want to give away this ice cream? Do I really want calories? If I don't want calories, then who would I give this ice cream to? And then what would, what would I, what kind of ice cream would they want? All of that. None of that is a choice. None of that is choosing. All of that is thinking and it's deliberating. Choosing is very simple. Choosing goes like this, vanilla or chocolate, vanilla. Now you've chosen something. Vanilla or chocolate? Chocolate. Now you've chosen something. So that's a choice. Most of us have deliberation and thinking and trying to get the right answer conflated, collapsed in with choice. And consequently, when we are given a choice or put in a space or made in, like an invitation is made for us to choose something, we can't. We don't have the capacity for it. Instead, we get collapsed, caught up in all of the thinking, the the um, agonizing over the decisions, trying to figure it all out, trying to make it all like come together, all of that sort of stuff. So I want to talk about that 
tendency, how we arrive there and what we do with it and how to actually start to develop your muscle in choosing and, and why you might do that. I just want to read what you wrote here, Amy. Thanks for sharing this. So Amy said, what your heart wants will require you to be tumbled and beat against the rocks. Yes, indeed. A heart-led life will require getting your heart broke. If I knew that I was going to be fine, no matter how this went, what would I choose? Then everything else that follows is your head trying to manage your fears. Yeah. It doesn't, I should say like, it doesn't mean it, if I choose from my heart, it doesn't mean every time I'm going to be smashed into the rocks, right? There's no rules to this, but what it means is if I live heart open, if I live heart first, the universe is abundant. And in that abundance, there are going to be situations where my heart is broken. The only way to ensure that doesn't happen is to try to manage the universe, manage the world around us and control it and contract, or to close my heart so it's protected. Those are the two ways to avoid having my heart broken. Both of those lead to a lack of fully heart openness. So it's not like the moment you open your heart, someone will come and punch you in it. Although it might feel that way because you probably have an atrophied ability to be with that sort of stuff. It just means that as we... Um, as we open our heart, we're putting ourselves at risk. As you take a boat out of a, a harbor, you put the boat at risk for foundering. A boat is safe in a harbor. If you leave your boat in the harbor, it is safe. It will never run aground, but that's not what a boat's for. Amy, yeah, it sounds a bit abusive, but I took away from it a comfort that it's okay to have your heart hurt, unlike common thought practice. Yes, yeah. In fact, that's often how we grow is our heart is broken and then we deepen from there and discover new strength and fortitude and, and new capacity to love from that place because we discover, wow, this is devastating and I can be with this devastation. And from there, we no longer need to protect ourselves from it. And that allows us to be more and more open until the next time we're devastated. And then we, you know, we heal, heal and, and deepen from there and then like, Oh, wow, I can be with that and deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay, so we started talking about choice, how it's collapsed in and how people have it kind of enmeshed. So the consequences of a lack of ability to choose are a couple. The first is that we tend to get stuck on the fence we get caught in analysis paralysis. And what we think, what we might suggest or kind of um, fool ourselves into believing is no, 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 I'm, I'm working really hard to choose, which is kind of a good way to put it because that's what you're doing. You're working really hard to choose instead of choosing. So what's happening when people get caught in this is they're trying to avoid making the wrong choice. Do you want this job or that job? Ah, uh, and then we get into our head, right? This is where our head gets in the way. And then we're like, well, what about this? How do I guarantee that? What about that? How do I guarantee that? Ah, uh, maybe I'll do a bunch of research and figure it out. The trouble is that you can never do enough research to fully protect yourself from the future. Because the future is vast and unknown and undefined, and it contains all possibilities. So you're kind of screwed a little bit. And consequently, your thinking just wraps in more and more and more on itself. It just becomes further and further. There's a lot of how anxiety gets created. As a result, people stop being, hey, Petra, people stop being able to make choices and instead they just get caught. They get trapped on the fence, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. The impact of that is that people are left feeling exhausted, tired, worn out, fed up, and kind of numb. They're numb because there's no capacity for them to like move forward into the world because they're caught at a crossroads sitting there for the rest of their life. The other thing that happens is from this inability to make a choice, your ego, your survival mechanism, your shadow will grab a hold of it and create all of these neat nuanced ways for you to try to solve this. So it'll be like, okay, I'm not choosing. So then what I'm going to try to do instead is I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what I really want. So now figuring out what you really want becomes the new version of like, I have to do that first before I exercise choice. So then you're going to go and you're going to sit and you're going to be like, well, what do I really want? 
And well, I'm resisting this, so maybe that means I don't really want it. But at the same time, I sometimes like this, and you can see it's like it's like when you're in a dream and you're having a nightmare and you wake up, but you wake up into a new nightmare. You you don't really escape it, you just leave that one conversation into the next whirlpool that's the exact same conversation. The the dressing, the clothes it's wearing look different. Oh no, I'm talking about what I want. But ultimately it's the same dynamic, which is you not exercising choice, you putting something in front of exercising choice. What we're putting in front of exercising choice the first time is the right choice, what's the right decision. And then the second time, what we're putting in front of choice is what do I really want? And you can play this forever. And, and many people do, we get caught in it. Panic attacks can sometimes show up this way because people are so afraid so petrified of making the wrong decision that they just get spun and then they're paralyzed. They can't, they can't do anything. They can't act in any way at all because this is so worn. This pattern is so, is so worn for them that they're just caught in a whirlpool and they can't get out. They don't know what to do. So what there is to do is for us to be in the practice of exercising the muscle of choice. When we exercise the muscle of choice, what we're really doing is we're simply practicing making a decision. Do I want vanilla or chocolate? I don't know. I'm going to choose one, vanilla. Here's another way you can make a choice, flip a coin. Yeah, but what if I make the wrong choice? The game here is to make a choice, not to make the right choice, not to figure out what your heart's deepest desire is, blah, 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 blah. And here's the beauty of this, if you're willing to practice it, is after making a choice, all of that other stuff, you're going to get a wealth of feedback that will help you determine the answer to these questions. So we put trying to figure out what we really want in the way of making a choice when making a choice is what would really help us discover what we really want. Vanilla, this is disgusting. I hate vanilla ice cream. I'm never going to choose that again. Great. Next time you're presented with a choice, you don't have to deliberate on what you really want because your choice revealed it to you. Oh, I want chocolate. Great. Oftentimes in coaching, really any service, like a lot of people want to practice doing more lives, more of this sort of stuff. And so what they put in the way of that is like, well, I'm afraid that people won't watch it, or I'm afraid that I'll say the wrong thing, or I'm afraid that blah, blah, blah. And so then they get engaged in this internal conversation about trying to figure out how to avoid all of that stuff. What do I need to say that people will engage with? What do I need to say that won't offend people? What will I need to do that will have people watch me? In fact, what you need to do is choose to go live. You're going to discover in your willingness to step out there to practice, as Heather just put it, in your willingness to practice is where all of this stuff reveals itself. The only way to begin doing that is to exercise the muscle of choice. <laughs> The funny thing, Heather, Heather says, you know, practice, practice, practice. Sometimes my clients get annoyed that this isn't enough for them to do. The irony of this is that their unwillingness to practice stops them from doing the stuff, right? So what most of us want when we say like, well, but that's not enough for me to do. We want someone to give us like a bunch of 50 different things to do so that we can then make the right choice. So it just becomes, well, give me a bunch of exercises to do becomes the new thing in the way of our choice. This, by the way, also happens a ton when people start working with a coach. They'll say things like, I really want to start, like, I want to go out and talk to people and invite them into a coaching conversation. For example, I have someone that reached out on Instagram and they're just asking me like, hey, how did you do this? And I was like, well, how many people are you talking to? How often are you inviting someone into a coaching conversation with you? And they said, oh, zero. I'm not doing that at all. Great. That's the thing to practice. And what they want and what happens when people get into a conversation about this with a coach, especially a coach not nuanced in their own ability to choose with a weakened muscle and choice, is that they just keep having interesting conversations about this. So instead of them being engaged in an internal conversation that is like, what do I really want? What's the right choice for me to make? Why aren't I doing this? What, what do I need to do to actually do that? You know, blah, 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 blah. They just get into that conversation with their coach. So then they bring to their coach. Ah, I don't know why I'm not doing this thing. Can we talk about why that is? And then the coach innocently, because they haven't exercised this muscle themselves, engages in this conversation with them. And it's like, yeah, sure. What do you think this is about? Blah, blah, blah. This goes back and forth. 
for a long time and then nothing actually happens because the coach is not able to stand for this person to exercise that muscle. Hey, we've talked about this four times in a row and I notice we're no closer to you making a choice. So what's it going to be? Are you going to practice exercising the muscle of choice here? Are you going to develop this in yourself or are we just going to keep having these conversations? And if so, how many more before you're going to make a decision? Clients are slippery this way, not because we're dumb or trying to outwit our coach or anything like that, but because our fear is formidable. Our fear and the accompanying ego designed to protect us from our fear, those two things are like masterful. They are masters. They're so slick. They can grab anything and use it to protect us. So they'll grab a hold of that coaching and then use coaching as the next thing to put in the way of them making a choice. So often there's a point and we get to in coaching, usually for the people I work with, where it's like, okay, it's time for you to practice. Do you want to do this? Yes. Are you committed to this? Yes. Does this like no if, ands, or buts, this is what there's going to be to do. Totally. Okay. Let's have that conversation. I'm ready, Adam. Great. Do it. Uh, well, I'm not ready. Well, you said you were committed. Are you actually still committed? So we're forcing the hand. We're taking away from people the stuff that they're using to continually and perpetually keep themselves at the effect and not living into a choice and then supporting them to make that choice. And it's edgy, especially at first when we're really atrophied in this. So the places we can begin are like simple things. For some people, even choosing what they're going to have for dinner is a real challenge. Excuse me. They're like, ah, I don't know what to have. We have a good friend who we would go out for dinner and it was always, it was, it was really fascinating to watch, especially cause I didn't have, I, I had no training behind me, no, no uh, coaching. So I just found it annoying back then. What happened is they would, they would check in with everyone to figure out what they were going to get and they deliberate. And then usually they would get one of the three things everyone else would get. They were just working so hard to not make the wrong decision in terms of their meal. Isn't that interesting? Just their meal, wrong decision. So that can be a simple place to practice. Go to a restaurant, choose something and give yourself at most five seconds or like two minutes. Okay, I'm going to scan the menu. I'm going to choose the thing. How do I know it's the right thing? You don't. You're going to discover. That's you exercising the muscle and choice at a low gradient. As we step further and further and further into leadership, what you'll discover is that you have to practice this at higher and higher gradients. There's no right answers in leadership. And the right answer gives us an opportunity to not have to make a choice for ourselves. The right answer ensures that the choice is already made for us. It's the right answer. So I just, I just follow it. There's no choice on my part. But remember that the leader forges into the unknown. And if you're forging into the unknown, you're going to have to make choices. And there's no guarantee you're going to make the right choices. You just have to choose. So that's the muscle of choice. Being able to learn to develop that is really a key part of leadership and coaching is the practice of exercising that muscle, letting ourselves empower the choice, and then seeing like, okay, how did that choice go for me? What came from that? What did I get out of making that choice? Am I happy I made that choice? Edgy stuff. Jess, thanks for sharing that. Jess shares, this combo makes me really aware that choice is my edge. For a lot of us, we are raised not this way. There's a better way I can say that. The way we're raised is that we're trained out of choice. Growing up, you don't have a lot of choice. You're told what to do. Then you get into school and you don't have a lot of choice. You're told what to do. And then we get into post-secondary education, some of us. And that's the first time in a lot of ways where you actually are given a choice, which is like, this is your degree. Well, first of all, choose a degree. And we're like, I don't know. I don't know what to choose. Or even if you do choose a degree, great, choose your electives. I don't know. I don't know what to choose. What should I choose? So we go looking for what we should do. And we might like, we, we grab for external cues to tell us what we should do. I did a business degree for three years. I flunked right out of it for three years because that was a good degree to have. And I couldn't trust the heart. I couldn't trust that my heart was like, do computers, man. I was like, ah, I don't want to sit. In, oh, computers are going to suck. I have to sit in front of a computer screen all day long. And then I come home and play video games all day long. There's a clue there for you, Adam. But instead, I was like, a business degree is a good degree to have. So I was 
that's an external example as opposed to choosing with my heart. Your heart knows the choice that's there to make. It already does. Okay, that's the muscle of choice. We're going to finish up by going through some questions on Quora. Some I love, some are weird. Some might be edgy. What should I do? What's the right thing to do? Heather writes, yeah, my history too. A lot of our history. The, the right thing to do, what we should do, the best decision, common wisdom, planning for the long term, all of these are ways that get us off the hook of choosing in the moment. Doesn't mean that they're all evil or bad or that we should abandon all of them, right? If you only ever lived in the moment, your life would be kind of like a cork on the ocean. You'd bob around and, and like might end up somewhere cool. You might end up somewhere crappy, but there's not a lot of intentionality to that. So there's a polarity here. There, a polarity between the alpha energy and the omega energy. The omega energy is all about the depth and the, the living in the moment. And the alpha energy is about our purpose and our direction and, and our intention and transcending the moment so as to see kind of longer term. And people that really live empowered, intentional lives, lives as leaders are able to manage to like hold the, the polarity of both of those. They are able to hold both alpha and omega energy present internally. That's where mastery lies. Okay. So I went through one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got seven things I found on Quora. I was just cruising. I, I like to go in the leadership um, place. And some sometimes these are silly. Sometimes people are asking questions like, what's the right thing for me to do as a leader? That as a question is sort of like me saying, what's the right pen for me to have as a writer? You know, it's so broad. So the first thing to do is like, go lead something. Like the answer to that question would be like, go lead something, find out where you're getting stuck, come back and bring that as the question. Where you're at is so far back that there's nothing to actually, you know, for us to really work with. Now, the first question I think is, <laughs> I just chose this one because it's hilarious. Someone asked, why can't people accept that I like Stalin, Stalin, Joseph Stalin, the dictator of Russia? Why can't people accept that I like Stalin for his leadership style and his physical looks as a man? Okay, well, let's answer it. I would say, frankly, because Stalin committed great crimes against humanity, caused a lot of harm in the world, and largely was a, a source of fear, hate, and, and evil. I want to be clear when I use the term evil that what I'm often, what I relate to evil as is, the, is our fear twisting our goodness into more fear which then has us do things we relate to as evil. So that's why, because Stalin committed great, 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 great crimes. If someone shot your sister in the head and then that someone else said, I really find this person attractive and love their leadership style, you would have a hard time accepting that. That's why. So this is really obvious, this one. There's not much to do there, but it's kind of funny that they've, they've asked this question and that they appreciate his physical looks as a man. As far as his physical looks, fine. You like a mustache? Man knew how to wear a mustache. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, what traits should leaders have? What makes a good leader? And this person, another person has written an answer and they say some of the numerous traits a good leader should have are fear of God, selflessness, Courage, intelligence, humility, boldness, listening ear, ability to carry people along. M many of those are great traits. Um, the first one I would, of course, probably like if you're listening, you probably also had the same reaction is the fear of God, I would say is not a very helpful trait. The fear of anything is there's nothing wrong with having fear, but as a trait that we want to empower in ourselves, meaning it's not that I simply have a fear of something, but that I like put it at the forefront. That's not a very helpful trait for a leader. What I would suggest a leader wants is an empowered relationship to spirit, access to spirit. And if your empowered relationship to spirit is looks like fear, 
it's okay, but I don't find that a very empowered relationship because it kind of makes it hard for you to spirit starts to become an authority figure. And then that starts to dictate what you do and don't have access to. And that's problematic as a leader because a leader should, what allows a leader to, to be most impactful is their ability to do and be whatever is required to create a particular result. All of these other ones are pretty great. Selflessness, courage, intelligence, humility, boldness, listening ear, ability to carry people along. But here's the flip side. For each of these, a leader also needs the capacity inside of themselves to be willing to be the opposite of these traits. So selflessness, you know what? Sometimes leaders have to be selfish. Sometimes we have to model going first. Sometimes we have to model to our people that we're leading that it's okay to eat the last slice of cake. Sometimes we have to model that even though everyone wants our time, we have to make sure our cup gets full. We have to make sure that we honor our well-being, even though there's going to be an impact and it's going to have an impact on the people waiting for us and needing our time. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm taking this vacation. There's a degree of selfishness to that. I'm putting myself first. I'm doing so because I know that when I fill my cup, I can better lead and people get more of me and what I provide is better than when I burn myself out. But people that just lionize selflessness tend to step over this. They do everything for everyone and then that builds resentment and exhaustion. And then what people get is sort of like this shitty version of generosity where it's like, I'm being, it's martyrdom, which is not a very compelling trait for a leader. Likewise, intelligence. Yeah, hell yeah, be a really intelligent leader, but also be willing to be really stupid. Be willing to ask the question that sounds kind of dumb and makes you look stupid. Be willing to be around a bunch of intelligent people and feel inferior and not try to react to that by starting to use bigger, smarter words, but being willing to ask questions like, hey, I don't understand what you guys are saying. Can you explain it to me? So like the trap of any of these traits is that they then become the dogma and leadership is um, it's tamped down by dogma. Anytime we have rules, dogmatic beliefs about what makes a good leader, what are the right traits, it gets in the way. And finally, the last thing about this that I'll say is that there's the common way to relate to this is that you either have intelligence or you don't. You're an intelligent person or you're not. Now I would assert, Grim B, oh, that cabbage right in my face. Let's move this fan. There we go. Oh, God. Pungent. Pungent what my dog is doing to me. I assert that all of us have the capacity for brilliance. All of us have the capacity for courage. All of us have the capacity for humility. We simply need to let go of the story that that is something you're born with or not. And we need to be willing to have that developed in us. Those two things are big barriers. Many of us are not willing to do that. We really hold that this is something you either have or you don't, in part because that gets us off the hook of developing this if we feel like we're not that person or if it's kind of edgy to own our own intelligence. And two, it, it, it means like we have to be willing to be a rookie, a novice, a beginner if we're going to have this developed in us. And that's really edgy for someone to sort of stand for intelligence when we're like, but I'm not intelligent. Stop wanting me to give you the answer. Right? We resist that. So all of these traits are beautiful things. And so is every other trait. The leader has access to all of it. That's what they provide. Okay, next question. Why do I feel like I've accomplished a lot even though I haven't done much? The reason I chose this is who cares? Who cares why you feel that way? Why does that matter? Why is that the question you're asking? So this is what a lot of us do is we have some experience or feeling and then we go, well, why am I having this experience or feeling? Why are you asking that question? What is your hope in getting that question at? Like, let's say because a cosmic ray hit you in the side of the head and it turned on some switch and that's why you feel accomplished a lot, even though you haven't done much. Now what? Where do we go from here? So the leadership conversation goes beyond simply wanting to know why. What for ask that question? What is it that that question is trying to get at? That's where we would go in that conversation. Why is interesting, but to what end? That's the trouble with it is that why is always very fascinating to explore, but it rarely leads us anywhere. And there's usually some question underneath why that we're hoping to explore. If you're a coach or a leader, my invitation to you 
is to practice not just answering why, not just exploring why, but like what for? What for explore this question? What is it that you really are, are hoping to get out of that? Well, if I understood why, then I might understand why I'm not really doing much at all in my life. Oh, do you want to be doing more in your life? Well, yeah, kind of, but blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, let's set that aside first. What do you want to be doing more of in your life? Now we're actually getting to a point where we're getting clear on a destination they want to arrive at. Then we can start to look like, okay, is this question of why actually in the way? That's how we move people forward in their life rather than just exploring why. It's kind of like if someone brought you into the garage and it's like, why is my car engine broken? And you're like, I don't know. Are you wanting to drive somewhere? Well, no, I need to go like, I need to walk up to the street and see my neighbors. Okay. Well, do you need to, is this important to that? Well, not really, but I really want to know why. It's not that we can't ask those questions. It's just, we want to be clear. Is that moving you towards what you want? What do you really want? As opposed to just exploring why and having neat, interesting conversations. Uh, Deborah saying, recalling coaching training says to never ask why, as opposed to who, where, when, how. I think that's a great piece of scaffolding for coaches early on. Um, that's more for the coach as opposed to the client. So the client is the one asking why here. The reason, at least in the coach training I took, where we don't ask why is because, you know, the question would be like, well, why are you doing that? The training I had is because that tends to elicit defensiveness in people. When we're asked why, we feel kind of on the, ah, I have to explain why I'm doing the thing. And so then we're invited not to do that. And the, the thing that happens though as a result is that why is it totally legitimate question sometimes? And what ends up happening is we become these really weird people speaking language that doesn't really sound very English. Like we start being like, well, what for is the purpose of you doing this particular thing? Instead of just saying, oh, why do you think you're doing that? So there's like, it's good as a starting point for coaches to kind of like learn how to ask more open-ended questions, to not put people on the back feet. And then there's a, a point, I think, where we got to tear that scaffolding down. You've got the house built. You can now just ask them questions like a human. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one. My husband is jealous if I go to the beach with the children. How can I make him understand that no one is looking at me? My husband's jealous when I go to the beach with the children. How can I make him understand that no one is looking for me? Cool question. So... The stuff I would say to this person, first of all, is, well, how do you know that no one's looking at you? Maybe people are looking at you. That's the first thing is like this person is trying to prove to their husband that no one's looking at, at them. And that I don't know if people are or are not looking at this particular person. But what I do know is that it's totally possible because the universe is abundant. And so trying to convince your husband or your wife or whatever, trying to convince them that no one's looking at you, that's never really going to resolve this because the issue is not out there with people looking at you. And if that is the issue, you're kind of fucked anyhow because the universe is massive. It's huge. There's abundance everywhere. So it's like if I try to, people will often do this in, a, in an area that can be a little less charged. It's like, I'm worried that if I dress the way I want, people are going to look at me and judge me. So I don't dress the way I want. And then they start talking to someone that's helping them, a coach maybe, and the coach gets on the court with them. They get into the context with them and tries to convince the person, no one cares about what you're up to. No one's going to judge you about what they're wearing. They're all focused on themselves. And they'll quote like the spotlight effect and how we put all our attention here and we don't really notice anyone else. That's missing the mark. Because in truth, if you dress the way you want, people are going to judge you for it. I guarantee you, because I judge the crap out of people for how they, they dress. And it doesn't matter. It becomes problematic when I start to act on my judgments and say, you look ugly. But I don't do that. I just notice, oh, I got a judgment. I have a story internally that there's a right way to dress. And it's just showing up right now and getting put on that person. So trying to convince ourselves or someone else of the lack of abundance in the universe is a fool's errand and will never really meet the mark. So that's the first thing is I would 
like, first of all, you don't know that people aren't looking at you and probably they are because that's what people do. I mean, most of us here probably do. When I go to the beach, I, I look at people and I look at them more if they're attractive. I'm drawn to look at attractive people. So what we do everywhere. In Europe, they, they get this. All the tables that you can sit at on patios have the chairs like this facing out so that you can watch the people walk by. It's very enjoyable. It's neat to notice people. We're fascinating. So we don't know that no one's looking at you. And I would, as a starting point for this person, begin inviting them to like let go of that story. So then the next question becomes, well, then what do I do about my husband's jealousy? And there's a couple things there. some of which will be a little edgy. The, the, um, so the heart of the matter is that someone's jealousy is theirs to manage, right? If I am jealous of my wife, Bay going somewhere and that's a problem, then it's on me to address my jealousy. But in a conversation in service of leadership, internal leadership, in a conversation in service of supporting people to be more and more responsible for their impact in their lives, there is also a conversation for us to bring to this person. Now, I wouldn't bring this to them if they weren't in a coaching conversation or a leadership conversation with me. But inside that place, what I would invite them to take a look at is, well, how are you creating in your husband this jealous response? Who are you being that might be generating this? How are you showing up that might be the reciprocal to this story. So one of the ways, first of all, would be, I would assert the claim that no one's looking at you. Because if I, if my, if I was a jealous person and my wife went out and I was jealous, I was, I was afraid of losing her and that people were looking at her and she came back and said, no one looks at me. That's gonna, what, what's gonna show up for me is sh people are looking at her, first of all, because I got a beautiful wife. And because people look at people and because I know I look at people. Second, she is claiming people aren't looking at her and I don't believe that. So now I'm kind of like, does she know they're looking at her and she's just lying to me? Is she complicit in this? Or is she just completely oblivious? And now I got to be scared of that fact. Now, the trap here is that people get like, this gets wrapped into common um, gender discourse and power dynamics, which is like, how dare you, Adam, suggest that this woman do anything about this man's controlling tendencies? But what that does is it, it, it makes it so that we, we kind of fall out of the fact that a relationship is a dynamic, a duad, a dyad, a dynamic. Should have just stuck with the first word I used. And so whatever's going on in that partner, you are complicit in. Inevitably, there is a reciprocality to everything that's happening. And so if that person really wanted to start to shift this, and I'm not saying they have to, right? They could just leave. That's an option. Leave your husband. Don't choose jealous people. The challenge there is you chose this person for a reason. The energy of this person drew you to them and, and the energy you bring drew them to you. So there's actually like a wound you both have that's available to be healed. And you can try to avoid that person. You can try to not date people like that, but the shape, the energetic shape of them is going to be irresistible to them, to you. You can't avoid this stuff. You can leave and recreate it with someone else, but that same flavor of energy is going to show up. So the conversation for this person on this side of the relationship starts to be like, hey, how are you contributing to this? What might you be doing? What do you get out of your, your partner's jealousy? How do you kind of play into this? What is the payoff for you in their jealousy? Does it make you feel kind of desirable in some ways? Does it make you feel loved? Does it make you feel wanted? Anytime we start to put all of the blame on another person, right? Every time we make this just about the husband's jealousy, it becomes problematic in terms of a relationship because that provides one person in the relationship an out, an automatic out. I don't have to be responsible for this. This is this fucker's problem. They need to address this, not me. Why should I have to take a look on my side? Because you're complicit in it, because you're in a relationship with them. On some level, you are creating some flavor of this dynamic. 
This even exists at levels of like abusive relationships. When one partner is abusive towards another partner, I can guarantee you that this person who's been abused, there is some training, some trauma in their own being that seeks out abuse. Maybe they were abused by their parents and that's how they learned to like receive love is when someone is yelling at me, at least that means I'm getting attention. Again, we don't want to blame anyone for this. We want to remove blame off the table entirely so we can look at the dynamic and so that we can support both people in the relationship healing the wound together. That's really tough because it requires both partners to, to let go of their righteousness that it's the other person and to come to it with each other and be like, okay, we're creating this together. How do we work on this? Interesting. I think that's interesting. That was cool stuff. Okay. Um, what else do we have? We've got, uh, how can you be a leader if you are not in an organization? And then one person has written an answer. You can lead yourself by not giving a fuck about other people's rules. Lead yourself by not giving a fuck about other people's rules. That's not leadership. So a leader has heightened sensitivity to the world around them and heightened resilience in their capacity to stay grounded and sovereign in partnership with that sensitivity. What, tend, what people tend to create is one or the other. So this answer this person's given, you can lead yourself by not giving a fuck about other people's values or rules. That is describing someone who has created all the sovereignty in the world by not giving a fuck, by diminishing their sensitivity to the rest of the world. So that's not leadership. That's aggression. That's, that tends towards abusive. And it tends to be abusive, not because you're an abusive person or you're evil or you're a shithead or you're a narcissist or whatever. It becomes abusive because abuse is inevitable when we are unable to become present, when we are unwilling to discover and hear about our, our impact on other people. If I refuse to listen to the impact of the way I show up on you, then inevitably I'm going to cause, I'm going to be abusive on some, to some extent, because I have no way to calibrate it. I end up saying things like, Hey, this is what's true for me. I'm just going to do it. And then meanwhile, you're crying because I told you that your face looks ugly or something. Now that that's pretty far out there, but hopefully you can get like the notion of just being a true, a truth teller, because you don't care about what other people think and it's on them to make their own decisions. That's a shallow representation of leadership. It's a shallow approach and it lends itself to abuse, not because we are nasty people, but because we have no capacity to distinguish between what's abusive and what's kind. We lose that. You can only distinguish that by getting feedback from the rest of the world. And the way this person's described this, don't give a fuck about other people's rules, is about shutting down your own capacity to see your impact on other people. Hey, how did this land with you? Well, frankly, I felt like I was leading a meeting and you told me I was boring and I needed to pick it up. And that felt really hurtful. And you seemed pretty closed and you didn't really acknowledge me for anything. I felt like I fucked up. Well, you know, I get that that's how you felt, but that's not what I intended. So I'm going to invite you. I'm going to be really powerful with you. And I'm going to invite you to hear me a different way. Fuck you, buddy. That's, that's like, there's no responsibility in that. And remember that the leader is able to be responsible for more and more and more. So don't leading yourself by not giving a fuck about other people's rules. That's a step forward. That's stepping from the first stage of leadership where we only let other people's rules dictate us and we censor ourselves completely. We're moving from the first stage to the second stage where you are now blurting, you're putting yourself out there. But to move from the second stage to true leadership, to transcend to the third stage, requires a willingness to increase our sensitivity, to feel more and more and more of our impact, and to let that guide our direction while not abdicating our own sovereignty. How can you be a better leader in, in the organization? So now I've, I've cut that answer to shreds. How do you actually be a better leader if you're not in an organization? Leadership has nothing to do with an organization, a hierarchy, a position, a role, any of that. 
I can be a leader as the janitor of a company. If I notice that I'm annoyed with the way the company does things, I can complain about it, or I can practice leadership by getting clear, like, hey, what's my request? And then going and bringing that request to someone and making an agreement with them and saying, hey, I'd really like this. I can be a leader by noticing the places where I blame someone else in my, in my family for, the, for my experience. And I can say, hey, how am I creating this experience for myself? How am I listening to them that's creating this particular reaction in me? That's leadership. So it has nothing to do with organization. And the more we get caught on the idea that to be a leader, I must be an organization, the further leadership becomes accessible to us. The, the, sorry, let me say that better. The more inaccessible our leadership becomes. Because now we're like, we're putting our leadership at the effect. I'll be a leader when I'm in an organization. Well, part of what might get you into that organization is a willingness to step into leadership now, today. Why do people always wish to lead, but not ready to serve? Interesting way they ask that. So I think he's saying, why do people always wish to lead, but not really to serve? And the answer this person had is, well, it may appear that way. However, the ones that are ready to serve just get on with it. They don't shout about it. They just do it. I have a bit of a different take on this. Um, my experience is that, first of all, people relate to leadership as a hierarchical, privileged position, and it's a one-way street. So the leader is at the top of the pyramid, and then they lead other people, and they do it the good way, whatever the good way is. So what that means is like, be a servant leader or lead by acknowledging other people, or lead by sharing your heart and your whatever the good way is that this person that I've made up fictitiously believes to be the good way to lead. But the most important part is whatever they believe leadership looks like, they believe that it's sort of like a pyramid where they're at the top in terms of, of feedback. And the feedback largely goes down. And they may receive feedback up, but there is no point where they are required truly to humble themselves. And what I mean by that is there's no point where they have to submit themselves to someone else's leadership. That's kind of how leadership gets misconstrued. And so what you end up with is a lot of people, like when, whenever I run a leadership team, we, we do a lot of work up front to get people really clear on what they're saying yes to, because what most people believe when most people ask, hey, I want to be on the leadership team, what they're really saying is, I want to be in the cool kids club. I want to serve other people. I want to show them all of their possibility and their opportunity. That's amazing. That's so cool. That is a huge part of leadership. The way you get to do that is by having someone stand for that in you. And preview, you already think you have it handled. So when it comes time for you to get your, your leadership brought out, addressed, worked with, it's really challenging. And that's usually the point where people say, I didn't sign up for this shit. In fact, this is exactly what you signed up for. You just thought you were signing up for something different. You thought you were shine, signing up for like the performance, the stage production of leadership. Leadership in the movie you watched where the cool kids were leading and they did it so fucking good and it was amazing. And they're not like those jickwads that, I, that was a mix of dickwad and jerkwad, those jickwads that led at Enron or whatever that crappy computer. That's how I, I'm going to do that. That's not really what leadership is. And so the vast majority of people show up ready to lead. They think they're like, yeah, it's my time. I really want to lead. And then when, when the bi-directionality of leadership shows up, they're like, I don't want this. By bi-directionality, what I mean is not that you lead, you develop the leadership of those under you and the people under you develop your leadership. That's not what I mean. I mean, you develop the leadership of those under you and you allow your leadership to be developed by those above you. And that both of those are essential to leadership. I have a client who um, is an incredible person and works for a really cool company doing amazing things. She's quite high up and they want... They really want to develop themselves as a leader, 
and they have a lot of criticism about the person above them leading them. And they, they have a lens through which they listen to this person that's sort of like, they're an idiot. They, what a moron. I can't believe they're reflecting this to me, blah, blah, blah. The thing in the way of my client's leadership is addressing the way that they're listening to the person developing their leadership, the person above them. And until they're able to hear that person up there through the lens of leadership and to really bring trust to them and like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to listen this person, not like a moron, but like they really have my best interest at heart. And I'm going to take what they provide me and I'm going to look to see how it's true rather than looking to see how it's not true and how they're, it's evidence of their stupidity. Until my client can open up to that, they're kind of hampered the same way in their ability to provide leadership to those below them. So that's the bi-directionality of leadership. It's not an arrow that goes up and down between the same two nodes. It's like a downward arrow from you to the person below you. And then likewise, the person above you down to you. Receptivity every step of the way. Okay, I think we have just one last one here. Why do emotionally insecure people rarely make good leaders? No answer provided for this one. Um, so the first thing that's worth noting before we get into like the heart of this question is that almost everyone has fear and emotional insecurity is just a flavor of fear. Some people, the way their fear shows up, like the way my fear would show up is I'd shut my emotions off. So it occurred like, excuse me, a lack of emotional insecurity, but actually it was just like being numb inside, like cut off from my emotions altogether, which ultimately at the end of the day was emotional insecurity, but people wouldn't necessarily have related to it that way. Likewise, some people are like finance, they're terrified financially. Why are those people rarely good leaders? And why are people that have an abundance of finances good leaders? But at the same time, a lot of people that have made a lot of money are still operating on over top of the same financial insecurity. They're terrified their money's gonna run out. So they're constantly trying to make more. There's never enough. You see this all the time with people that have accumulated great masses of wealth. You ask them what they, if you go and watch the coaching conversation I did with the guy named Tyler, you'll see his whole focus is on money because he wants freedom. He's completely imprisoned by money. He has no capacity for freedom. Money dictates his life and it's not making him any happier. happier. So that's the nature of this kind of stuff. So, but now let's look, why do emotionally insecure people rarely make good leaders? Well, First of all, I want to be clear that I guess this is second of all, because I already did a first of all. Second, just because you're emotionally insecure doesn't mean you have to stay there. You can develop this. You can work on this. You can move beyond emotional insecurity. I know this is true because I have. I now have the capacity to have emotions. I can let myself feel what I feel rather than pretending that there's no emotions at all whatsoever here. So being emotionally secure is not a death sentence. It's not the end of the road for a leader. It's just what's next to develop someone's leadership. Having said that, why is emotional insecurity? What about that as a roadblock to leadership? As long as we're emotionally insecure, we don't really have the capacity to be with the emotions of other people. We either get swept away in them. Someone else's sadness becomes our sadness and oh my God, or we, we keep them at a distance like I was doing. Someone shows up sad, I become very stoic. And then that person feels like there's about 50,000 miles between us. There's no, <clears throat> there's no ability for me to be there with them. At best, I can be there for them. And being there for someone is way different of an experience than being there with them. Transformation can only happen when we're there with someone. When you're there for someone, you can help them, you can do some stuff, but it doesn't really work. See you later, Heather. So that's the first problem is an emotionally insecure leader lacks the capacity to be there with someone because they're either swept away in their own emotional range or they're actively working to keep it below the surface, kind of like a beach ball you're holding underneath the water. Second, if we take out emotionally and just talk about insecurity, how does insecurity show up and make people poor leaders. What insecurity tends to do is it makes people, it makes it really tough for people to let other leaders shine. Either because I can't stand for leadership because I'm 
constantly deprecating and berating and hiding myself because I don't believe I'm enough. That's going to make it hard for me to stand in any kind of space for leadership. Or if the way I've learned to be with my insecurity is by overcompensating, then what tends to happen there is I, I seek to create wins and awesomes and great results. But of course, there's never enough to address my own internal story of insecurity. And so consequently, what happens is I always need the spotlight on me. I will yank the spotlight off of my staff and bring it back on myself. You've been around people like this where they seem to like it. Every conversation starts like it's like, oh, someone's going to get acknowledged here. And then it comes back around to them. And we label this like, oh, they're narcissistic. We, we're very uncharitable about this. The tragedy of that being that we can't see the actual truth underneath our shitty label we've just slapped on their forehead. The truth is it's just fear and fear can be worked with. In fact, anytime we're developing leadership, that's what we're doing is we're transmuting fear into art. And so people with insecurity like that, there's a real opportunity there. We just have to be willing to do our own work and then to sit with them longer than the point where we say, fuck you, narcissist, this person's not a candidate for leadership. So that's why insecurity and that's why insecurity represents possibility. It's simply fear and fear equals possibility. Okay, thanks for hanging out everyone. I think we're gonna wind down there. Seriously, why can't people accept this person for the fact that they like Stalin and his physical looks as a man? I accept you. That's fine. Do whatever you like. Um, <laughs> there's more I want to say on that now, but I'm not going to. That book again was Illusions by Richard Bach. Highly recommend this book. It's really potent, really beautiful, really great book on leadership and coaching. Um, and we're heading into September now. So thanks for hanging out. I hope you guys have had an awesome summer and uh, enjoyed the show and we'll catch you next week. Bye-bye.